Hello everyone, it's wonderful to uh, see you all here. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Today um, is the um, eLife Symposium on the um, impact of this COVID-19 um, pandemic um, on Cancer Outcome uh, Symposium uh, for our special issue in, uh, in the same area. So um, I will uh, quickly hand over to the chairs of the meeting today, um, Diane and Eduardo, to uh, sort of talk a little bit about the, the special issue um, before we, we begin. I also um, am very excited about the symposium and excited about your participation and those of you who are listening uh, to gain new knowledge. We had an extraordinary event over approximately 18 months with a COVID a pandemic shutting down many people's uh, ability to have health care and many people's ability to do research. Not everyone, as we'll hear, was completely shut down, which is pretty amazing. Um, but uh, it was a big disruptor. And the fact that you were able to continue to do rigorous scientific research on documenting it and documenting its effects um, is a real tribute to you and to your um, dedication to science. Uh, we appreciate that. We appreciate you sharing this evidence uh, with us and specifically sharing it with eLife. Um, I probably should have introduced myself first as um, one of the deputy editors of eLife. Um, and Eduardo is uh, one of our senior editors who has been with eLife um, since its inception. And we are delighted that you chose to share your work with eLife. So Eduardo, please take it. Thank you very much, Diana. Thank you all for, for joining us today. Uh, so this is a uh, representative set of presentations from a collection of 28 articles that have been properly curated, uh, peer reviewed and available. They're fully available for free in, uh, also on New Life's uh, website. And uh, these 28 articles, uh, they, they form uh, uh, the full spectrum of uh, epidemiology and global health, cancer biology, medicine, computational and system biology. And your presentations today, in fact, are microcosms of uh, what this, this spectrum of uh, submissions have been predominantly on uh, epidemiology and global health, which is not surprising given the background and uh, the original intent of, of this session as, as Diane uh, indicated. So there will be a, two additional pre-recorded webinars, which uh, as along with the four that will be presented live today, will be available on your live uh, uh, host of the website. And I ask the speakers today to adhere to their, their, their allotted time uh, uh, so that we'll have time for questions at the end, even though there's a little bit of buffer time at the end, but uh, we'd like to, to keep this on time if you, if you will, please. So let me ask, uh, uh, ask Emma now to give some guidelines um, so thanks, uh, Eduardo. Um, we want everyone here to be able to enjoy the symposium. So to do this, uh, we ask that everyone um, involved um, abides by the life's code of conduct. Um, that is to um, be uh, respectful of different views um, and opinions um, and uh, give um, and uh, accept constructive feedback um, and ensuring that uh, you're um, maintaining sort of the time lots to um, and uh, in, both uh, as a speaker and uh, as someone who's asking questions. Speaking of questions, after each talk, there'll be um, a few minutes um, allotted for, for you to ask questions. Um, so we ask that you um, provide these in the chat box to make sure that we don't miss them and we can then read them out. Uh, please do feel free to add your name and, and uh, affiliation or title um, at the end of your question. Uh, we are recording the event as well um, to make sure that it will be available um, on our website for everyone who wasn't able to make it today. Um, and closed captions are enabled, so um, you should be able to um, read along with the transcript as well. Um, if you have any technical issues, please do feel free to reach out to Anya, um, in the, who's uh, another member of the eLife staff uh, in attendance. Um, so I think that's the housekeeping out of the way. Um, so, without any further ado, um, I will uh, hand over for the um, uh, first uh, speaker to be introduced, Irene Stalong. Wonderful. I'd like to introduce Irene Mann. 
um, who will be presenting from Lyon, France, uh, from the International Agency on Cancer Research uh, with her presentation. So, um, Irene, please. All right. Thank you a lot for inviting me to speak uh, with this, within this very interesting symposium and to also be able to contribute to the uh, special issue. So, um, as introduced, I'm uh, Irene Mann, coming from uh, um, the Public Health Decision Science Team from the International Agency for Research on Cancer. And so for us, yeah, it has been a while ago that we, we have gone through the pandemic and maybe some of us would maybe even think it has been a while, why do we care still? And so this with this talk, I really want to um, kind of bring us back into some of the lessons we have learned during the pandemic time and to think how we can prepare for uh, the future to make our cancer prevention more resilient and to use the normal time um, uh, that we have to prepare for, uh, for possible next disruption. And in particular, uh, concentrate on cervical cancer prevention and thinking about the role of gender neutral uh, HPV vaccination can have in this. So to bring us a bit back uh, in the history, uh, so yeah, how did it go with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and the disruption uh, concerning cervical cancer and HPV vaccination specifically. So uh, we have seen disruption worldwide in different levels. Uh, first, we have seen that the production of HPV vaccine was really limited uh, to favor the manufacturing of other vaccines. And um, in some country where vaccination program of HPV already existed, we saw a um, much slower delivery and decrease of coverage. And in some country where um, um, uh, it's most, yeah, the mostly lacking behind in terms of introduction of HPV vaccination, the launch of uh, the program were also delayed. And this is, uh, this, yeah, we can see it in like the screenshot that I've taken of the WHO uh, uh, HPV uh, coverage dashboard, particularly in the year uh, of um, uh, the pandemic, we see really a decrease in the coverage. And this is, this seems not so much, but if you can think of the coverage that we have um, in worldwide mostly is mostly in um, high income country where you have uh, a stable vaccination program, we are not even see, seeing here the effect of uh, programs that have been delayed in introduction. So um, as a more dramatic picture that you uh, that I have uh, found here in some country, you can see even so as for example, here in Malaysia, the coverage were really decreased in a very, very uh, dramatic way. And apart from um, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, it is, there are actually also a lot of other reasons why the uh, HPV vaccination can be disrupted. So here on the right, uh, there's an example of um, uh, uh, disruption of coverage due to vaccine hesitancy in Denmark. And in some other country, maybe political system uh, instability can also lead to uh, long-term disruption of HPV vaccination. And to think also that many of the people who have missed their vaccination may not be able to catch up it later because it is quite difficult for health system to restart and, and catch up uh, uh, young girls and boys before they uh, uh, go beyond the age where they can benefit from vaccination. So in this context, we were really thinking of what are the ways that we can make our uh, vaccination program, uh, the cervical cancer uh, prevention program more resilient? And even before the pandemic, uh, um, well, a few of my co-authors already thought about that. And they have published earlier um, a publication focused on the setting in Sweden, in which they, uh, using modeling, could show that by switching to gender neutral vaccination, we could make um, we could mitigate the disruption of uh, the possible disruption by switching to gender neutral vaccination in terms of um, um, 
blocking the transmission of HPV infection. And so in uh, when we were thinking about writing something for the special issue, we thought we wanted to extend this work and to bring it a little bit further to adapt it to the uh, context of, in, of a low and middle income country, as well as uh, looking at the eventual impact on cervical cancer cases. And so this is what we have done. Uh, in this study, we have tried to investigate the resilience of switching to gender neutral vaccination, uh, comparing it to uh, what if a country would uh, stick to girls only vaccination. And we have tried to explore different scenarios of uh, disruption in terms of duration and uh, degrees of disruption, because there could be many different types of disruption. And as a um, outcome to judge how resilient the program is, we projected the lifetime number of cervical cancer cases that can still be prevented in the cohort that get disrupted by uh, possible events and compare it to uh, the cohort that were not disrupted. And that is how we defined uh, uh, our measure of resilience. And as a case study, we have taken India uh, because it is uh, uh, a country with a very high burden, uh, one of the yeah the country of which we expect in the future to have uh, the highest number of cervical cancer cases expected if uh, vaccination would not be introduced. Um, so, how did we do that? Uh, in at IARC, we have been working a lot to uh, develop a context uh, responsive platform for modeling. And for um, this modeling study, we have taken um, two of our models, Epimedes and Atlas, which is adapted to the, um, the, the data of the Indian context um, based on um, um, yeah, many uh, studies in terms of sexual behavior, uh, HPV prevalence, and cervical cancer to be able to predict the impact of uh, uh, vaccination on cervical cancer. So in terms of the um, disruption scenarios we have uh, uh, simulated as a base case, um, we have uh, simulated um, uh, a period of 10 years of vaccination, after which in the model we have switched out vaccination uh, for five years, after which we restart vaccination again. And uh, in the normal time in the 10 years before the disruption, we also vary different setting of uh, high and low coverage. And as we said, girls vaccination or gender neutral vaccination. And as some uh, um, sin yeah, possible sensitivity sin uh, scenarios of how disruption can go, we also uh, try to um, vary the duration of disruption from only a year to no recovery at all and uh, less extreme levels of uh, residual coverage such as 20 or 40 percent. So what did we found? Um, here in this slide uh, I have um, presented the lifetime number of cervical cancer prevented in the disrupted cohort uh, and uh, show it against what would what would yeah what would be the number yeah uh, the impact in the undisrupted cohort. So I would like to first guide you to uh, through the uh, impact in the undisrupted cohort, which is quite interesting. So uh, as first you can see, girls vaccine girls only vaccination of sixty percent of course is um, giving you the least impact compared to higher uh, higher coverage in girls, vac with girls vaccination or gender neutral vaccination. Uh, but uh, concentrating on the two scenarios in the middle only, uh, a very interesting uh, pattern can be seen. So if you compare the scenario with 90% girls vaccination, you're actually using um, a less number of doses than gender neutral 60% uh, sixty percent coverage. But still in the undisrupted cohort, 
you can see that scores only 90% coverage scenario is giving you a higher uh, uh, level of protection. So this is in line with what uh, many other modeling uh, exercises already have found. During normal time when there's no disruption, ghost uh, vaccination is usually more efficient. But if we turn to the uh, um, impact in the disrupted cohort, which is uh, given with these uh, hollow circles, we can see that um, um, in the scenario where we have 60% gender neutral vaccin uh, vaccination, um, it's actually giving you a higher resilience than in uh, an earlier compared scenario where you have 90% girls vaccination. And if you compare across all these scenarios, you can see that the, uh, the, the, the strategy of switching to gender neutral vaccination is really giving you um, much higher resilience across the different settings. So in other words, we can say that gender neutral is really um, more resilient uh, against disruption. And here is um, the, the same uh, indicator, but then uh, in other sensitivity settings that I've just uh, discussed about. So uh, across the different sen uh, sensitivity analysis about the the length of disruption, we see the same pattern. So again, um, in during normal time, uh, girls only vaccination could be more efficient, but during disruption time, um, boys vaccination, which is given in blue, are usually giving you a higher resilience. And so if we think about in the scenarios, for example, uh, in India, where you would have in the situation where you have only girls vaccination and 60% of coverage. So would you then think about switching to uh, uh, gender neutral vaccination? So what we can show across our different scenario, uh, putting it into like a number, we can really say that um, by switching to gender no uh, neutral vaccination, it will uh, give you about two to three times more resilience as compared to uh, if you would try to increase the coverage in girls only. And this pattern is also uh, present if you have a higher, already a higher coverage in girls of 90%, and still then um, by adding voice vaccination, it could still increase your resilience during disruption time for uh, up to two, uh, two or three times uh, as much. So this is sort of, uh, um, some of the reasons why uh, we want to switch to gender neutral vaccination in terms of resilience. Actually, there are um, also other benefits of gender neutral vaccination. Um, and in the India setting specifically, we have checked that for, for example, with girls only vaccination, 60% uh, coverage only, it may not be enough to reach the WHO elimination threshold, but by switching to gender neutral vaccination, it would be enough. And another reason to think about gender neutral vaccination is that uh, by adding boys to the program, it could make it more socially acceptable for the girls to uh, get the vaccination, and it may therefore even increase the coverage in girls. And um, uh, as the third uh, argument, um, for the sake of equality, it is also important to think about direct protection of uh, uh, possible HPV-related cancer in men, such as uh, cancer in head and neck, anal, and penile. So to conclude my presentation, um, uh, I hope I have been able to demonstrate that gender neutral is uh, is really attractive uh, strategy to be able to uh, make our cancer prevention program more comprehensive and resilient. And um, in some cases, it can also help accelerate uh, progress towards elimination of cervical cancer. And we can think of that kind of like an insurance scheme uh, um, to like that we can prepare during normal time um, before 
the possible next disruption arrive, which we know uh, someday will happen, unfortunately. And some point that I do want to uh, uh, highlight as discussion point is that, of course, gender neutral vaccination does require additional financial efforts. Uh, as we said, it is less efficient than girls only vaccination. But in many settings, it has already been shown that it is, it is actually cost effectiveness and affordable. And uh, if we think about that, all these cost effective analysis have not taken into account um, possible disruption. Uh, so if we do somehow incorporate that in our evaluation, uh, gender neutral vaccination is actually more cost effective. Uh, but of course, there's currently not really um, like health economic framework that can also help us incorporate this kind of scenario of disruption in our uh, definition of cost effectiveness. Maybe that's something we could think about in the future. And maybe it will be also useful to think of some kind of set of stress test scenarios that we, we would like to uh, be prepared for uh, while uh, planning our cervical cancer or other cancer uh, prevention program. So with that, I would like to conclude my talk and thank my uh, co-authors and uh, the funders that have funded this project and the organizer for inviting me for the talk. And we'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Irene. That was awesome. Um, while uh, Anja and Emma are looking at questions in the chat, I was wondering if you could address, I think you touched on it in one of your slides, but um, is the time frame during which both men or young girls and young boys can be vaccinated, is that a fixed time frame such that should they age out mm. if disruption lasts longer, say between you know the ages of 11 and 13, they can get vaccinated, the disruption yeah. lasts three years, would that entire mm -hmm. cohort then not be vaccinated and did you look at that as you went through your models? Mm. So in the model, we kept it fairly simple. We just say uh, there is like well, one age group of um, normal routine uh, target age of vaccination. So in the if uh, disruption lasts for X number of years, X number of cohort will then miss their vaccination. But of course, in, in some countries like um, as I know, in Brazil, they have a whole range of um, uh, age range in which people get vaccinated. But still, I think even for Brazil, if I'm not, if I'm recalling it correctly, uh, most girls still get vaccinated in quite a narrow, uh, n more narrow range of uh, age than across the whole band of age. Uh, and so, yeah, it's it depends. Eventually, uh, of course, we in some country they are already thinking about catching up um, the cohorts that have not been vaccinated. But it may not always be something that is possible to do. And so, uh, yeah, from that perspective, uh, so yeah, this how the findings should be interpreted. Great. We have a question from um, our viewers. Can you say more about the reasons why gender neutral vaccination is less efficient than girls only vaccination? Mm, yeah, so you can think of it as like an indirect, indirect way uh, of protection. So for a vaccine uh, in boys to be effective in uh, uh, in protecting our girls of getting cervical cancer, that it's uh, it it has to uh, the boys have to be in contact with the girls that is going to um, get the cervical cancer, but maybe the girl is in contact with another boy that is not uh, uh, vaccinated. So by directly getting the vaccine to the girls is uh, would be yeah is therefore a more efficient way to use that uh, vaccine. Mm. Great. Um, and then another question is, what do you think about some of the religious barriers in the coverage of HPV vaccination? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, yeah, I think in in it really depends on the context of the country. Um, I think in some country, actually, by um, uh, making a program, a gender neutral program, 
uh, without saying that it is specifically for uh, cervical cancer and that is related to a sexual transmitted disease, it's actually making it more socially acceptable um, to kind of brand it uh, as uh, a vaccination against cancer um, for both men and women. And I think that is, I think that is really the way to go to, uh, to, to be a, like a, yeah, like a way that in, that may fit in many religious and, uh, cultural setting. Great. Thank you very much, Irene. There are other questions in the chat, but at this point, um, we're going to move on, um, and, uh, see at the end of the program, if we can address them or they can directly email you. Thank you very much. So we heard from uh, Irene Mann on vaccination. Let's go to something else that has also been disrupted, and that's screening for cancer. And uh, I'm happy to uh, to invite to speak uh, Tina Beth Hollison from the Danish uh, 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 Clinical Quality Program National Clinical Registries, and she'll be speaking about nationwide participation in cancer screening in Denmark during the COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Olsen. Thank you so much. Okay, so thank you for the um, invitation to present this study on the participation in cancer screening in Denmark during the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, please. Um, so this presentation is based on three studies which were published recently in eLife. Next slide. Um, in Denmark, the cancer screening programs, they were actually continued throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. And this is in contrast to many other countries worldwide. So the aim of our study was to examine the participation in cancer screening in Denmark during the pandemic compared to the previous years, both overall and stratified by socioeconomic variables. Next slide. The pandemic in Denmark um, comprised of uh, three main waves, one in the spring of 2020, one in the winter of 2021, and again in the winter of 21-22. The pandemic response in, in Denmark um, the pandemic response in Denmark uh, comprised an early lockdown um, from the beginning of March 2020. And in Denmark, there was also extensive testing for COVID-19. Um, these tests were free of charge for everyone. And, and in Denmark, laymen were trained to perform COVID-19 tests. And that means that healthcare personnel were not burdened by this um, uh, additional task. Um, high vaccination coverage against COVID-19 was also achieved in Denmark. Um, and again, the vaccination was free of charge. Next slide. Um, in Denmark, all women aged 23 to 64 years old are invited to participate in cervical cancer screening every three or every five years, depending on the age groups. And these women receive an invitation letter and then has to book um, an appointment themselves with either their general practitioner or gynecologist. All women aged 50 to 69 years old are invited to participate in mammography screening every two years. These women receive an invitation letter with a fixed appointment at a mammography screening clinic. And then um, all individuals aged 50 to 74 years old are invited to participate in colorectal cancer screening every two years. It's a home-based test and the test kit is uh, mailed directly to these individuals together with the invitation letter. Next slide. So we included all individuals in, invited to participate in uh, cancer screening in Denmark from 2015 until 2021. And we used data from the uh, cervical cancer screening database, the mammography screening database and the colorectal cancer screening database. And we merged these data with the socioeconomic data from Statistics Denmark. We did descriptive analysis, and then we used a generalized linear model to estimate prevalence ratios and 95% confidence intervals. 
And the explanatory variables that we included were age, ethnicity, cohabitation status, educational level, and disposable income. Next slide. So this graph shows the participation in the cervical cancer screening uh, during the study period. Um, firstly, within 90 days since invitation, then within 180 days since invitation, and then within one year since uh, invitation. And you can see that there's a marked reduction in the participation in uh, can cervical cancer screening within 90 days at the start of the pandemic. However, with longer follow-up time, only a small reduction in participation is uh, seen. Next slide. And this table then shows the prevalence ratios of participation in cerv cervical cancer screening within one year since invitation. And again, you can see a small reduction in the overall participation, but when you then stratify by uh, socioeconomic variables, um, you can see that there's a lower participation among descendants of immigrants and also among women with a low income. Um, next slide, please. Um, and these groups of women uh, they already have a low participation um, in cervical cancer screening, which is then reduced during the pandemic. Next slide, please. And then we looked at mammography screening. And again, we see a uh, reduced participation uh, uh, at the start of the pandemic when we look only at the nine, 90 days uh, interval. And again, with a longer follow-up, uh, only a small reduction in the participation is seen. Next slide. Um, and again, this table shows the prevalence ratios of the participation, and we see a, a small reduction in the overall participation. And then when we stratify by socioeconomic variables, um, we can see a lower participation among immigrants and among women with a low income. Next slide. And again, um, these uh, groups of women um, already have a, a lower participation um, in mammography screening even before the pandemic, and this is then reduced even further during the pandemic. Next slide. And Finally, we looked at the colorectal cancer screening, and here we can see, uh, again, a reduced participation at the start of the pandemic. Um, and if we then change the uh, length of the follow-up time, it is ex it is not, uh, the participation is not increased. However, what we do see at later time points during the pandemic, we actually see an increased participation from the first reopening of the society in Denmark, uh, and then onwards, um, as shown in the small table on the right side. So next slide, please. Um, and again, this table shows the prevalence ratios, and we see as a reduction uh, at the start of pandemic, and then an increased participation uh, at the later time points during the pandemic. And then we actually see um, certain groups who have um, um, a markedly increased participation, and that is uh, individuals aged 55 to 59 years old, and then also immigrants. Next slide, please. And these groups, um, in particular immigrants, they have a low participation in colorectal cancer screening, and here we then see an increased participation of, uh, uh, during um, from the first reopening and onwards. Next slide. So in conclusion, um, the, we find that the participation in cancer screening is reduced at the start of the pandemic um, uh, when we look at the 90 days uh, time interval and with longer follow-up um, there's an increased 
participation in cervical cancer screening and mammography screening, um, meaning that the uh, uh, that there's only a, a small reduction in the participation with longer follow-up time. But we do see that some groups of women, um, uh, mainly immigrants and women with a low income, they have a lower participation um, during the pandemic, um, and in particular at the start of the pandemic. And these um, groups of women have a low participation already. And then for colorectal cancer screening, um, we see an increased participation uh, during the later time points of the of the pandemic. Next slide. Yeah, so I'd just like to uh, thank uh, Eli for the invitation. Uh, and then I'd like to thank the co-authors and also um, the Danish Cancer Society and the Danish Re Regents for funding the study. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Olesen. Uh, uh, very nice. Uh, very nice coverage from a very courageous country, of course, in uh, not many countries. And this served as a counterfactual to many countries which uh, did close their screening programs during the, the pandemic. Uh, we have questions here in the chat. How is Denmark uh, screening for cervical cancer itself sampling? Very important point from my co-chair here, Dr. Diana Harper. How is De uh, Denmark doing with self-sampling for cervical cancer screening? Um, yeah, so at the time of this, at the time of the study, um, self-sampling was not uh, implemented. As far as I know, um, it is um, it is being introduced on a trial basis. Is it is not introduced nationwide yet? Um, uh, as far as I'm aware, yeah. It's in the capital city, but uh, Dr. Jasper Bond, I think, is leading a study. Of, yes. uh, of of self sampling. Yes, I think uh, you're correct. Yeah. Now, Dr. Olison, what do you think about this uh, interesting thing happening with colorectal cancer? Huh? They didn't it was not as much affected as breast and for ninety days as cervix, and then eventually there was a uh, gain in Ex participation. Yeah, exactly. I think it's really interesting, but it just shows that uh, that the home based tests are. Um, a good way forward, um, and I also know from a, from a study in in Sweden that they actually switched to self sampling uh, for uh, for HPV for cervical cancer screening uh, during the pandemic, um, um, and then they achieved an increased coverage um, uh, for for the participation in cervical cancer screening. So, um, so. For some reason, they they do have a a, a, a benefit, and um, and and we see that even among immigrants, and an increase an increased participation is seen. Uh, I I cannot fully explain our results, but um, this is what we observed at least. But it's a very powerful analogy because you have colorectal cancer screening has been on, in self sampling. Yeah. For quite some time, and it serves as an interesting analogy for what we're about to uh, to learn with cervical cancer screening. Another yeah. powerful analogy is with the previous talk by Dr. Irene Mann is that this is building resilience. You know, she showed an example how gender neutral vaccination yeah. builds resilience, and self sampling is one way of building resilience for future mishaps in the public health, uh, providing public health uh, care to uh, to countries. Exactly. And I think in a way, our study also shows that that you can actually continue uh, cancer screening programs during a, a, a time of crisis that we, that you do. You see a reduction at, at, at the very start of, of, in this case, of the pandemic, but then you see a, a normalizing of the of, of the participation. Um, so, um, yeah. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Dr. Mirabel Zane has a question there, uh, and a comment perhaps, maybe due to more time by people take care of their health, you know, that uh, an extension. You know, people use yeah. the pandemic time to reflect about their own health, yeah. right? Yeah, definitely. That could be a very good uh, explanation for the increased participation. Yeah, definitely. 
Thank you very much. It's in the interest of, time, interest of time, we need to move on. So let me ask uh, my co-chair here, Dr. Harper, to move on. It is um, my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Miriam Elzen to us, who is looking at the other side of uh, the COVID impact, which is actually on the healthcare providers. Uh, and uh, Miriam, please take it over. So can you see my screen? Move it uh, to presentation mode. Perfect. Can, yeah? Perfect. You see it? Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, just commenting on the, the fact that people had more time, uh, you know, especially for the colorectal cancer screening. This is a good reminder because I still have that self-testing kit in my drawer. It's been there for the last two months, so. I will sure do it tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so thank you so much for really like uh, organizing this symposium. And uh, honestly speaking, you know, let's say I find it interesting to go back yesterday and to read our own paper, you know, which was like, a, I don't think it's an exercise of what we actually do, you know, let's say, because we just present our findings, you know, and then we publish the paper and we never go back. So it was really like a nice reflection of the amount of work that went into, and as uh, Dr. Harper was mentioning at the time when we were like in a complete lockdown. And so, and we still, you know, let's say persevered and performed, you know, let's say research and involved our students also in research activities. So thank you. And thank you for also like organizing the symposium because I did not read most of the, you know, let's say the papers that were you know, let's say uh, published in the special issue. So it's a nice opportunity actually to to see uh, the findings and you know, let's say the depth and breadth of the uh, of the presentation. So yes, so I will be presenting today results. Nothing fancy, mostly descriptive uh, of our nationwide um, online survey that was designed to investigate uh, the impact of the pandemic. And to capture actually also like any modifications on uh, pandemic like uh, prompted on, you know, let's say related uh, delays or like uh, postponements of cervical cancer screening and management related activities uh, across uh, Canada. Uh, this is my disclosure slide. And so the main uh, aim of the survey was to assess the early impact of the pandemic on cervical cancer screening, on diagnoses, on management and treatment services across Canada. And we also wanted at the same time to identify any approaches that were used by our healthcare professionals in Canada to mitigate the impact of the pandemic on their practice and recognize, you know, let's say windows of opportunities, positive aspects that could potentially enable the transformation of cervical cancer screening along what was like just like presented by our speaker in terms of HPV self-sampling and other approaches. So the survey uh, like included uh, several questions and these spanned across like the continuum of care, like in cancer, in cervical cancer uh, control and care. Uh, we had like uh, along, these were formulated along five themes, along screening practice, treatment of precancerous lesions and cancer, telemedicine, over and under screening. We asked also like our respondents about their perception, whether there was like over or under screening prior to the pandemic. And uh, the last like theme was resumption of in-person practice. And you could see that most of the questions really like focus on screening practice. And also the section like this theme had also like subsections including like questions on appointment scheduling, a screening test, what kind of screening test, did we use like HPV, did we use cytology, did we use both, uh, and also like HPV self-sampling and follow-up also like uh, screening. So for the first three themes, we asked our respondents to consider as the period of interest, you know, let's say to span from mid-March to mid-August of 2020, and for the theme on the resumption of in-person practice, uh, we ask them uh, to consider as like the timeline of interest at the period from mid-August 2020 to the day that they completed uh, the survey. And the survey was completed and we targeted, you know, let's say healthcare professionals, uh, so including colposcopists, cytopathologists, family physicians, and, and many more. It was bilingual. And uh, I would really like to highlight, and I don't think we did it enough justice in the paper, that uh, this was really an extensive uh, exercise on the part of uh, our students, you know, let's say were involved to really formulate these questions. Like there was like 61 questions, you know, formulated and it was uh, 
it was all done from scratch. Like we didn't have like a, a baseline questionnaire, you know, let's say to use and adapt. So it was really, we wanted to focus on each of these themes and come up and came up with like questions that would really like address in, a, in, a, in an efficient manner, you know, let's say what we wanted to capture in terms of their response. And this is why, you know, we had like many rounds with many experts in the field. These are experts in cervical leaders and cervical cancer screening and management. And we also did, did like uh, several validations also with our internal team here at the Division of Cancer Epidemiology. The survey was administered between November of 2020 and February of 2021 using an online-based survey tool also that was like, uh, you know, let's say designed by our uh, students. And we reached out to several like uh, professional Canadian societies, you know, such as the Society of Canadian Colposcopists, Society of Gynecologic Oncology of Canada, the Canadian Association of Pathologists, and the Society of Obstetrics and Gynecologists of Canada. And who in turn reached out to their members, you know, they emailed them several times uh, with the link of this survey, uh, you know, let's say to, 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 fill it, to fill in. And we also reached out to family physicians via other platforms, such as MD Briefcase. We also used our internal resources. And we posted also a link to the survey on our on social media platforms. So we had a total of 778 responses, of which 510 were considered to be valid uh, surveys, and uh, 418 of which were fully completed, which is really like pretty good. There were more female than male respondents and across various age groups. The mean age was almost like 45 years. And most respondents were from Ontario, from British Columbia, and from Alberta, with some from Saskatchewan, and some from here, from Quebec. And most uh, professionals, you know, let's say who completed the survey were general practitioners and family physicians. They constituted uh, around like 45% followed by gynecologists, obstetrician, gynecologists, like around 22%, nurse practitioner and registered nurses, around 15%, and colposcopists, around 10%. They were mostly practicing in private clinics, so around one third were practicing in private clinics, and we see like an equal proportion of like almost uh, a quarter uh, practicing community hospitals, public clinic, and university affiliated hospitals. So since it's a massive, let's say, uh, for those who read the paper, since it's, it's a massive really undertaking and of like so many questions and each question has like sub questions, I will only focus on just few main uh, results. So if you look at the screening appointments and if you look at cancellations, there were around like 64% uh, cancellations of screening appointments and 75% of uh, postponement of screening appointments. And if you look at by province, we see that these were largely uh, from reported from Ontario, as you see in the gray, and uh, largely also by uh, primary healthcare professionals in blue, and uh, largely also by uh, those practicing in private clinic, which is in in yellow. And here if we we see also like that there were some cancellations or postponements of treatment procedures for the for the different types of treatment procedures. And by province, we see also that these were mostly like uh, reported in Ontario, for Ontario, and for British Columbia as well. And expectedly, you know, let's say, uh, if we consider by profession, they were prob like mostly like in primary and uh, tertiary settings and reported uh, to have been uh, by place of practice in university affiliated hospitals and community hospitals. So another, you know, let's say, I would say it's like, a, it could be a positive and a negative impact, but like there was a lot, you know, let's say of respondents that said that uh, there was actually 384 respondents, uh, which are like amounts to 90% that they say that their institution, you know, let's say, or their practice, uh, you know, let's say was moved to, uh, to telemedicine uh, during the time of the pandemic. And when we asked about, you know, let's say their perception of whether there was over or under screening pre-COVID, uh, you know, we see that uh, 190 respondents, which is like 45%, said that there was like, yes, over screening, over diagnosis and over treatment uh, pre-pandemic with like mostly 20% uh, reporting the issue of over diagnosis before the pandemic. For the under screening component, you know, let's say a total of 82% uh, reported 
that there was like under screening, under diagnosis, and under treatment of cervical lesions pre COVID. This is a nice logo that we, we developed by our team, you know, like it's the spikes of the coronavirus. This is the dates of the survey it was done by us. So, uh, but so overall, you know, delays we found that were present across all provinces, all participating professions at all places of practice. And the most like uh, affected uh, component was really like appointment scheduling. Professionals from community hospitals reported the most colposcopy and treatment delays, and community health centers reported the most follow-up delays. So these are like extra, extra findings, you know, because I couldn't show like all the figures that uh, we were ge we generated and we uh, uh, report in the manuscript. Uh, fortunately, around half of respondents reported that they had caught up with the cancellations and the postponements caused by the pandemic. And uh, the most like important findings also is that we saw that there is opportunities to implement alternative screening and follow-up practices. So 40% agreed that the pandemic would facilitate implementation of HPV self-sampling. And as I showed previously in the slide, 90% reported that they used telemedicine during the pandemic. A uh, few thoughts, like final few thoughts. The survey results do provide insights to help limit a future pandemic's collateral damage, cervical cancer prevention and care. And the major challenges that were reported by the professionals could inform policymakers uh, to plan the next response, an appropriate one, and could help guide capacity building and resource allocation to build resilience in the provincial healthcare systems. Our results can inform epi epidemiologic models, mathematical models, that can be used to study the long-term effects of pandemic-related disruptions on cervical cancer, particularly in Canada. So I'd like to finish with acknowledging uh, our experts, you know, let's say, who are very patient, you know, let's say, uh, with us and really helped shape the final version of the, of the survey. Uh, this is like, uh, this is a snapshot actually of our team meetings because all of the survey was designed via Zoom via our like regular meetings and particularly with uh, Rami and Elia who led the design of the survey, our master students. We thank also the societies that assisted with the distribution of the survey. Uh, Dr. Miller was the director of the COVID-19 for his insights on the survey. And Dr. Troti who also like, like helped uh, verify my French translation of the survey uh, of the survey questions. Yeah, so, and I, and I thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Zen. Um, I have a particular question. I was curious whether you, you had noticed that 50% of the participants indicated that they were able to kind of catch up on the patients that were admitted, um, but that leaves 50% of people who still have canceled appointments or haven't come back. And I just wondered if there was... Um, Granted, I realize the study's done and it's over. Yes, I, exactly. I wonder just your thoughts on um, whether you think the trends are that everybody would get back and would get back into the system and get screening, or that there might be permanent loss in to follow up from that. I don't think there's a, there's a backlog. You know, let's say there's probably did like a backlog. You know, which like was also the exacerbated the already existing backlog. You know, like, and talking with our clinicians, you know, let's say, uh, and our collaborators, uh, they tried to, let's say, adopt uh, alternative ways, you know, let's say, like, also, like, telemedicine, like, you know, let's say, calling the people again, uh, you know, but they have seen, uh, you know, and it, it's, they have seen, right, like, uh, that there's, like, uh, more advanced stages of these, like, cervical precancerous lesions, probably because these were missed, you know, let's say, during uh, during the pandemic so we're still trying to catch with the backlog i think uh i think you know like i'm not i'm not uh, positive but i think given also that our healthcare system like is free as you know let's say as uh public you know let's say i think you know let's say these women will eventually come back to the screening albeit at later stages you know like uh, yeah great we have a question from susan kelly what do you think are the policy messages that resulted from your findings? Well, yeah, I hope that, you know, we don't have a short term memory and I hope that we will be prepared uh, for the next one. And kudos to Denmark for really not stopping their uh, uh, cervical cancer screening program, but like uh, 
I think we would need to do like a lot of messaging, you know, let's say to ensure also the population about the safety, you know, let's say of continuing to come to the screening uh, appointments because like part of the message here, like in Canada was stay home and I don't agree with that. Uh, so like a lot of people really stayed home <laughs> when they needed, like uh, even if for not for cervical cancer, but for heart issues or whatever. So I think, yeah, so they really need to listen to, to us. <laughs> You did present some data um, by the different regions of Canada, provinces of Canada that responded. Um, if you normalize them to each particular province, mm -hmm. was there a difference in the way that the provinces uh, reacted or compared in their screening? Well, yeah, because yeah, because it's, you know, like all of the all of the results that I showed, right, a reflection that you know, let's say that the survey was mostly reported, let's say, by healthcare professionals and. In Ontario, and that you know, let's say, like, so we did not do like any normalization, you know, let's say in terms of we just wanted to dis to describe it, you know, like, uh, uh, so yeah. Just from looking at your graphs, it seemed to me that um, while Ontario was the biggest responder, Ontario had um, the biggest number of cancellations. But when you would take that and divide it by the number of Ontario responders, yeah. those ratios seem just from a very visual over. Less similar, very similar, right? Similar. So, yeah. Um, uh, but it, it would be interesting to see um, were there any differences or <clears throat> was the pandemic just so bad that everybody felt everything? Yeah, yeah, interesting Something for Thank future. You. Yeah, yes, I think we'll move on. Shall to we? Shall we move on? Sure. Thank you very much. And uh, and then uh, we get to the fourth uh, uh, real time presentation of this uh, webinar series, and that Dr. Dolland Muka Epistudia in Bern in, uh, from Switzerland. And uh, he is going to add another angle to the whole story on patient care in addition to cancer prevention and management. So Dr. Muka. Dr. Franco, thank you very much for inviting me here today. And yes, I'm going to catch up on, uh, on a broader perspective of what was discussed so far, but also giving a little bit of insights about the impact of COVID-19 across all spectrum of cancer care. Um, so, I mean, our generation will definitely remember the empty series because of lockdowns and lots of social distancing measurements. And of course, all these measurements taken together also affected healthcare. Uh, and we saw that there was a decrease in medical procedure in the redistribution of healthcare staff also, face-to-face -face appointments were not any more prevalent as before, so we switched to using technology and uh, we use them to uh, make appointments re uh, uh, remotely with uh, uh, also ourselves, but also with the patients. And also there were restrictions of patient access to healthcare facilities. And when we speak about cancer care, we are dealing with a specific uh, subgroup of patients who really need uh, specialized care and um, that is also what we investigated in terms of how the pandemic affected cancer care uh, uh, and for this uh, reason we use the umbrella review uh, for those who do not know is a systematic reviews of systematic reviews so we, we gather all systematic reviews uh, uh, together in order to see uh, uh, the to see all studies that were focused on this topic and we looked at the main databases uh, on which umbrella reviews are, are done. So PubMed and WHO COVID-19 database, specifically to COVID-19. Uh, when it comes to eligible studies, they had to be systematic reviews, which included or did not include uh, a, a meta-analysis. And they had to include um, cancer patients or patients or people who were targeted for cancer screening and assess the impact of the pandemic in several outcomes. Um, and here I have highlighted the main ones because actually we looked also at other ones. So we looked at whether there were changes or delays in treatment. We looked whether there were delays in, in cancer screening as well as diagnosis. Uh, also, we explored whether there were, I mean, the pandemic affected the psychological well being in different levels, including here also the ethical distress. And also we included studies that, in, uh, that looked at the impact on financial uh, burden of, of COVID-19 uh, at an individual level, but also at the national level. 
And also we, uh, we explored how um, telemedicine and other technologies uh, impacted cancer care during the pandemic. Uh, other fact, I mean, other outcomes that we also explored were whether uh, there was any change in terms of smoking prevalence, as well as HPV vaccination uh, uptake. So um, overall, from the search, we identified 1,170 uh, relevant citations or references, which after the screening ended up with 51 uh, uh, systematic reviews to be included. Uh, of these systematic reviews, 14 articles included quantitative data, so they pulled data from different uh, studies. Um, then usually the, the number, the, the average number of studies that were uh, used by these systematic reviews were three. Uh, what we saw that was very prevalent in these uh, systematic reviews was the fact that most of these studies were based on uh, uh, cross-sectional or retrospective data. And therefore, also the level of evidence generated by the systematic reviews in general was of low uh, quality. Um, and also something to highlight is that the majority of the findings or the data were coming from high and middle income countries, with very few data actually coming from low and middle income countries, uh, which actually also, as we know now, they face the most burden when it comes to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic for many reasons. So in the next slide, I'm going to summarize our main findings when it comes to the main outcomes we explored. Uh, so when it came to the treatment modification, actually there were 15 systematic reviews we identified exploring this topic. And most of these systematic reviews were very consistent in terms of, of highlighting that uh, there were changes in, uh, in uh, treatment when it, come, it came to cancer, uh, to cancer care. Uh, actually, the, the most changes were affecting the surgical procedures and the guidelines were a little bit um, also discordant in terms of uh, the, the role of surgery, the timing, and especially when it came to application of early tumors. Um, and also like a few studies looked also at that, I mean, at the data in terms of uh, uh, quantitatively, and also they found that uh, these um, changes in treatment were present up to, I mean, uh, up to 65% or affected 65% of cancer centers. Also something that is very important here is that uh, when uh, it came to the evidence that, um, that lead, uh, led to these changes in treatment, actually the evidence was in general quite low. So leaving lots of space uh, in terms of um, exploring in the future um, how these changes in guidelines uh, were, uh, uh, were developed, but also what would be the impact in terms of cancer outcomes uh, later on. And for this, the data are, are, are limited. Um, and then when it came, uh, it came to the uh, diagnosis delays, the treatment delays, screening delays, and psychological uh, and other outcomes, uh, uh, most of the actual systematic reviews were focused on these topics. And here I have summarized the data from the quantitative analysis um, that we generated from these uh, uh, systematic reviews. Um, if we explore, for instance, diagnosis delays, we, we saw a reduction um, in terms of screening first um, in, in all, across all cancer, including cervical cancer screening, colorectal cancer screening, and breast cancer screening. And the reductions were up to uh, 50%. Uh, of, uh, of, pay, uh, of people being targeted for cancer screening compared to pre-pandemic areas. But actually also uh, uh, based also on what was uh, presented before, uh, in general this was a U-shaped uh, relationship where we saw a, a, a huge reduction at the first uh, period of the pandemic because of the lockdowns, but later on this now, I mean the, the, the delays in, 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 in cancer screening Actually, this, uh, this started coming very closely to the uh, pandemic times later on during the pandemic. And similar trends were, uh, were also observed when it came to the delay in overall treatment, where especially at the, be at the beginning, because of the lockdowns, uh, we saw a, a, a large reduction um, and mainly this affected the uh, surgical procedures. Also another area that was uh, uh, very highly explored from the systematic reviews we included in our analysis were the uh, uh, psychological uh, well-being. And actually, um, when we looked at the data on depression and post-traumatic stress disorder, 
the prevalence among cancer patients were uh, almost uh, 30 to 40 percent higher uh, during the pandemic compared to pre-pandemic area. And when it came to uh, uh, factors maybe driving this, uh, 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 this increase, um, of course, as I will speak later, were uh, uh, social isolation, but also we saw that fear of cancer progression, which is very common uh, on, on patients who are diagnosed with cancer, to also increase highly during the pandemic times, with uh, more than 70% of, of patients reporting higher um, uh, fear uh, of cancer progression during pandemic compared to the pre-pandemic times. Um, but uh, when, I mean, of course, the, the, the question here is whether all these factors affected uh, cancer prognosis and outcomes included mortality. But uh, from our umbrella review, actually, we saw very few limited studies that explored this topic, like how cancer del uh, treatment delays, diagnosis delays, uh, and also psychological and uh, uh, distress affected uh, prognosis of, uh, of cancer uh, patients. And few studies that we identified, they were based in general from modeling studies and very, I mean, uh, with no uh, basis on real world uh, data. Two other outcomes of importance that we, uh, we tried to explore was financial distress and social isolation. Um, on this topic, uh, actually, there were uh, only five systematic reviews that explored this topic uh, with very few data within this, uh, 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 these systematic reviews. Uh, while in general there was, um, of course, uh, reported financial distress with direct and indirect cost burden for uh, a cancer patient. Actually, this, this information was not very clear. Uh, and here also patients reported lots of uncertainty when it came to the job and also whether they could pay uh, also the medications later on because of uncer uncertainty with the pandemic. Um, and also one uh, very important uh, factor here that we uh, uh, identified through our umbrella review was the presence of social isolation. So cancer patients, because of many factors, fear of infection, social distancing measurements, uh, not having visitors or lack of social interaction, they tended to isolate more than the other uh, uh, people uh, in, uh, during the pandemic. And of course, uh, how this affected health, it's something that we don't know yet, but uh, we know that social isolation uh, has a negative impact in many uh, domains of health. Another uh, factor that, of, uh, that also uh, we explored was telemedicine and use of telemedicine. Uh, and uh, uh, usually telemedicine was mainly uh, used for virtual visit, uh, visit and also consultation. And studies that looked at, um, at how uh, telemedicine was perceived by a cancer patient in general showed that cancer patients really liked it and find it very helpful. At the same time, they all expressed uh, concerns that this shouldn't be a substitute for face-to-face -face appointments uh, rather than an add-on for, uh, uh, for their care. Um, so, um, like to conclude, of course, we saw also the other outcomes uh, that were also touched upon before. For instance, like we saw HPF, uh, HPV vaccination, which were uh, also explored in our systematic reviews and shows hu showed huge reduction, especially during the first uh, period of the pandemic with up to 90%. Um, and overall, uh, our data showed that um, actually during the pandemic have been modification delays and cancellation of treatment. Uh, delays in cancellation in cancer screening and diagnosis, and patients with cancer may have experienced additional psychological, social, and financial distress. Nevertheless, something important to, un uh, to highlight here is that the level of evidence coming from these studies is in general low because it's based on, on uh, observational data. Uh, and also our understanding on, on how these negative uh, factors actually impacted uh, heart outcomes in cancer prognosis, this is not yet clear because we still, I mean, we, we lack such data and it'd be very interesting to, to investigate this topic and uh, using uh, uh, robust studies. So in the end, uh, I'd like to thank all co-authors and especially John Yanidis, uh, whom I work with on this uh, topic. And uh, yeah, thank you for listening and very happy to, uh, to answer to questions. If I know the answers, of course. <laughs>
Thank you very much, Dr. Muka, on your last point about uh, how imperfect that wave of science that came after the pandemic or during the pandemic, uh, it was truly incredible. So now we're trying to make sense out of that. And that's the very purpose of having this collection of articles curated by Eli. So uh, the Dr. Diane Harper has has an interesting point here because you did you were critical of uh, guidelines that can be restrictive. So do you have any suggestions on how to craft guidelines that allow for or compensate for or build the resilience uh, in relation to disruption? Um, I think this is a very important point. And uh, what we know this is that in general, these were consensus guidelines, which we know in general are very biased. And actually having uh, different stakeholders in terms of defining these guidelines with different expertise, not just clinicians, but also people who uh, um, are expert, for instance, in evidence synthesis, this could really be helpful that as we progress during the pandemic, we can gather evidence and adopt in an evidence-based manner, uh, manner the, 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 the recommendations. And this is something that I think was lacking, that in general, uh, can, uh, like the, the, the centers were driven uh, on their procedure by seeing what others were doing rather than really uh, seeing the entire evidence. Um, and this is something that we maybe can change, like doing living, let's say, systematic reviews in the future uh, in uh, these specific areas really can help shape evidence-based recommendations uh, uh, in terms of uh, doing the, the right policies. Thank you. And what do you think uh, about the use of AI uh, for counseling and, uh, and drone delivery? Well, Diane, I, had, I missed that. And drone delivery for cancer medicine. So this, this is coming from my co-chair, Dr. Diane Harper. Very interesting point. How can we take advantage of all of these new technologies that are coming along? Not only those that are you know, online, such as AI, but the drones, in fact, for delivery of devices and medicine. Well, I think this is a very uh, good question and something we definitely should look at the future. Um, uh, I, I, I don't have any data in terms of, of, of this topic. But of course, um, AI can help automatize some of the procedures. Um, and especially, for instance, when it comes to uh, what I've seen, for instance, like uh, uh, in cancer screening, for instance, can prior prioritize groups that are at risk, but also in terms of helping delivering the, the treatment on time when, let's say, we are in a, in a situation of lockdowns or, uh, or, or the pandemic measurements. Uh, but uh, all these uh, solutions have actually to be tested and uh, what I always highlight is really uh, when we start implementing these procedures or um, any kind of intervention to uh, really have in mind doing proper designs that also we can see the efficacy of these, uh, of these interventions in terms of uh, not only delivering the best care to patients, which is the most important, but at the same time, also seeing the entire impact, including here the economic impact. Thank you. Do you see any analogy? I mean, we're in, in addition to the pandemic, as we stepped out of the pandemic, then eventually we have a world, the geopolitical turmoil that we're currently witnessing. And there is, of course, healthcare has been disrupted because of war. War torn areas are being affected. Do you see any analogy, any message that could be? Brought and there is, uh, I'm not watching that science, but I'm sure there's a science that's coming out of uh, healthcare delivery in war torn areas. And uh, hopefully, there will be some lessons to be learned here. Well, definitely. I mean, uh, we can, I mean, we can tell that um, in war, we see uh, sim some similar patterns what we saw during COVID. So people are more isolated and they have less access to healthcare. Also, the use of virtual medicine can be uh, more uh, can come more to help during war, same as to the pandemic. And actually, these learnings that we had during the pandemic on in terms of uh, how these, let's say, tools, new tools like telemedicine could improve care, this could be also implemented. At the same time, uh, have an understanding that uh, uh, like the social isolation per se uh, can can also be disruptive. And uh, we need to see how that we uh, how we can fill that in during a war, which is also it's it's I think it's more difficult than when it comes to the pandemic. Uh, and also the message when it comes to war goes to the politics. <laughs> I, I believe now I mean politics has a really big say or all uh, how we can manage wars in terms of not having wars at all, 
and uh, that would be the message. I mean, we, we need to live in peace. Uh, we all love each other and we should uh, try that politics comes together to, uh, to make humanity for better and not for uh, uh, looking at fights within each other. That's a great uh, high note to, to end uh, your presentation. I greatly appreciate that. I, I think we could now, uh, let me go back to my co-chair. Perhaps we should open now for all speakers and to entertain questions that uh, we didn't have a, an opportunity to go in more depth. Diane, you wanted to, uh, sure. there's uh, a question, I think. Yeah, there was a question for uh, Dr. Mann. Um, uh, what could be the reasons behind higher lifetime numbers of cervical cancer prevented with the gender neutral vaccination programs compared to the girls only vaccination programs? Mm. Yeah, so I think the idea behind this is uh, when you when you think about the age difference between uh, uh, like boys and girls, men and women that's yeah, come in a relationship, usually it's the men who is a little bit older. And when you disrupt uh, vaccination, you can think about, okay, the women of uh, that will that are missing the vaccination are actually with uh, in relationship with the men who have been vaccinated in a few cohorts earlier. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, that is mainly the reason I think. Awesome, thank you. Well, I want to say, um, uh, and and I would like to invite Eduardo as well, but I would like to say that I am incredibly impressed with all of the presentations and with the work that you have done um, in all aspects of this. And um, I'm truly appreciative of uh, the time that you've put, the rigor you've put into the studies. Um, and I'm also very thankful and very optimistic that our future is in good hands. You are amazing researchers, and I want you to continue doing all of this amazing work. So it gives me a great pleasure as I'm at the end of my career, looking forward to who the new people are coming in. So um, I will turn it over to Eduardo for his comments. Thank you, Diane. Indeed, you know, I, I, I would like to make your words mine. Uh, I, it, it has been an incredible journey. Uh, it's quite complicated at times because, as you can imagine, and we wrote in our editorial, Diane and I, we, we, we did an analogy. We made an analogy with the COVID pandemic, the science that has emerged with the COVID pandemic with that of 40 years ago with the AIDS pandemic, HIV and AIDS. So between the time, between January 2020 and mid-2023, there had been 420,000 articles published on COVID-19. And by analogy, there were 500,000 on HIV and AIDS, but that's over a much longer time span of 40 years. So that just gives you an idea of the trying to drink from a hose. And it, it was absolutely, and this was clearly captured by Dr. Muka's presentation in, in those umbrella reviews, and he was critical of that science that rather imperfect, but provides a snapshot of what a whole new field of research has gone. And uh, he did mention, for instance, the, uh, the fact that we haven't seen enough prognostic studies, studies of survival on cancer, the impact on that, and those will come for sure. But there's an important aspect that Diane and I, we, we had to contend with during the production of this monograph of this special issue with 28 articles was to find few reviewers. Just imagine what it is to a field of research that's brand new. Lots of people moved from what they were doing to doing COVID-19 research. They, despite the fact that they, they were lockdowns and everything, the reviewer fatigue that set in was absolutely incredible. So it was people were essentially fed up in reviewing COVID-19 papers. Imagine 420,000 of them coming in a period of uh, two years. That's a whole field of research that far as none. There's nothing that got close to that. So from the perspective of a scholarly journal such as eLife, you can imagine the challenges that have been uh, uh, brought to us to be able to curate the best possible science to be become the record of this important uh, point in our in history, not only in medical history, in public health history, but in history in general. 
So uh, there's a silent note here that I have uh, gratitude to all the reviewers that contributed mm -hmm. to the papers that we produced uh, via eLife, mm -hmm. of which you just heard a wonderful sample of four presentations. There'll be two more that have been recorded that represent this microcosmos of, uh, it's a, a macrocosmos rather, of uh, research on, on such an important topic. Uh, and uh, and uh, with that, I, I, I will ask uh, if Emma has any comments and uh, she is giving you pointers here where to find all this science. Uh, so I just wanted to thank once again, um, all of our incredible speakers today and the um, speakers uh, of the pre-recorded presentations um, uh, for for the uh, that you'll see in the um, posted version uh, of the webinar. Um, that will go up um, on our um, website in the coming weeks and everyone who's registered to attend will receive an email notification. So you'll be able to basically immediately check out those those two pre-recorded presentations there. Um, my colleague has dropped the direct link to the uh, special issue in the chat. So anyone who wants to go ahead and read the wonderful science, both from these speakers, from pre-recorded speakers, and from the whole uh, wide array of, of wonderful uh, contributors to the, to the special issue, uh, you can do so. Or if you would rather uh, have something you can keep in your brain, elifesciteorg forward slash COVID hyphen cancer, uh, which is a bit easier to type out than, than the uh, full link. Um, you can also follow us on uh, a lot of different social media sites um, at elife. Um, I included X, formerly known as Twitter, uh, but we're also available on like Mastodon, LinkedIn, Facebook, and, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so thank you again, everyone, for attending. And um, it's been really, really wonderful to, to see you. Emma, may I just uh, oh, put a, a, insert another note of thanks to someone who I think at some point was in the chat, uh, oh. Maria Guerreiro, who was with us from the very beginning in, in, the, in the concept of this special issue on COVID and cancer. And uh, at one point, uh, we had uh, some 45 uh, people in attendance. I suppose those will be recorded, right? There will be a recording of these presentations available to everyone. Yes, yes, absolutely. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Diane, for, for being my great partner with this. Greatly appreciate that. Absolutely. This has been good. Thank you all. Hi, and thanks for the opportunity to share our work with you today. My name is Associate Professor Carolyn Nixon from the Daffodil Centre. On behalf of my colleagues, I'd like to introduce our presentation. This work was conducted um, in, during the COVID pandemic. It was work funded by the Australian Government. We were commissioned to assess the potential impact of the COVID pandemic on our three major screening programs for cancer breast, bowel and cervical screening. We produce detailed technical reports which are available on the web and then we work together to produce the eLife publication that we're summarising today. As you'll see, the estimates, the scenarios, the projections all vary quite significantly between the programs and that reflects both the natural history of the cancers in those programs and the interventions that are available, including the design of the screening programs. I think this has been a really useful exercise for understanding the COVID pandemic, but also more broadly, the potential effects of major disruptions to cancer screening programs and where the sensitivities lie and where, um, where the programs are robust. So I'll now pass to my colleagues to walk you through the findings from each of the programs. My name is Dr. Luisa Valencis, and I will be presenting the COVID-19 modelled impact on the Breast Cancer Australia program. The Breast Cancer Australia program offers free biennial mammographic screening targeted at women aged 50 to 74. We simulated three scenarios compared to business as usual using the Policy 1 breast model, including a 3-month, 6-month and 12-month pause starting on the 1st of April 2020 
after agreement with the Australian Department of Health. The main assumptions for the three and six month scenarios were the service recovery would gradually increase relative to business as usual, reaching 100% by month six. And for the 12 month pause, we assumed the capacity would increase to 150% from month seven to 12. We also assumed the screening outside the program would be reduced to 50% during the pause, returned to 100% after the pause. For each scenario modelled, we estimated short-term and longer-term changes in outcomes, which included screening delays and client types affected, diagnosis of invasive breast cancers, features of breast cancers diagnosed, and program sensitivity. A prioritisation module was also added to the model to prioritise clients during the recovery period and assign them to available screens. For each week of the recovery period, clients who had a screen during the pause or during the recovery period were prioritised for available appointments according to screening round, age, and if the screen was due or overdue. The module assigned clients at the top of the queue to appointments with remaining clients pushed forward. The period of time that screens were delayed was limited by the maximum delay threshold as indicated in the table. Although we modelled a number of outcomes, I will focus on a few main ones for this presentation, but please refer to the full report for details of additional outcomes based on the link provided in the slide. Yeah. One of the main outcomes was diagnosis of screen-detected invasive breast cancers. In the first 12 months following pause commencement, compared to 127 cases of per 100,000 women for a business-as-usual scenario, we estimated overall reductions in diagnosis for women 50 to 74. These range from 117 to 100,000 women for the three-month pause, to 99 per 100,000 women for the six-month pause, and 97 per 100,000 for the 12-month pause, but bearing in mind assuming the higher throughput recovery of 150%. The same trend was also observed in invasive breast diagnoses at a population level. In terms of tumour characteristics, we estimated that screening pauses would result in more advanced cancers in women 50 to 74 years. Over the 12 months following the pause, we estimated a reduction in small breast cancers with a proportion of diagnoses ranging from 56.5 to 59.6%, an increase in breast cancers spread to the lymph nodes ranging from 25% to 26.4%, and a shift towards high-grade cancers, most apparent for the 12-month pause. These differences are expected to attenuate over time with only small differences observed across the period 2020 to 2023. Hi everyone, I'm Joe Worthington on behalf of the Colorectal Cancer Research Group at the Daffodil Centre. We were commissioned by the Department of Health to simulate COVID-related pauses to the National Bowel Cancer Screening Program, or NBCSP. The NBCSP sends faecal tests to all Australians aged 50 to 74 every two years, for the early detection of colorectal cancer and precancerous polyps. Upon a positive faecal test, individuals are then invited to a colonoscopy to detect the cancer. Our model, Policy 1 Bowel, simulates the development of bowel cancer as well as detailed Australian screening through the NBCSP. For this project, we simulated hypothetical COVID-related pauses to the NBCSP in 2020. As this modelling started in March of 2020, we didn't yet have real-world data on changes to participation, so we simulated a number of hypothetical scenarios. These scenarios included three- and six-month pauses to the NBCSP, as well as a 12-month pause to the NBCSP with full catch-up screening provided in 2021 for people who missed screening in 2020 due to a pause. For each of these scenarios, we estimated short-term impacts on colorectal cancer outcomes in 2020. For the six-month disruption scenario, compared to a program with no disruptions in 2020, we would expect to see 38,335 fewer colonoscopies generated by the program. This would lead to 1,223 fewer colorectal cancer diagnoses in 2020 
and of these, an estimated 529 colorectal cancers would progress to a later stage before diagnosis. This could potentially lead to lower survival rates for people with a later stage cancer. Since the release of this paper, we've had screening data from the National Bowel Cancer Screening Program released for the year 2020. Although there was no formal pause to screening, a deficit of 111,000 screening kits was recorded, a 6.3% decrease versus the expected number based on previous years. Similarly, data on colorectal cancer incidence and mortality changes, as well as changes to staging, is not available nationally. However, based on our estimates, this real-world drop in kit returns would lead to 221 additional colorectal cancer cases and 101 additional colorectal cancer deaths over the next three decades without any catch-up screening. Additional modelling found that catch-up screening could reduce this additional cancer burden by over 80%. Hello, my name is Michaela Hall and I'll be talking about modelling disruptions to our National Cervical Screening Program, or abbreviated here as the NCSP. When Australia's COVID restrictions were rolled out in March 2020, we were 27 months into a transition from two yearly to five yearly cervical screening. All women were recommended to attend for their first HPV test two years after their last pap test. And so we expected fluctuations during the transitional period as most women would attend in the first two years of a five-year cycle. Therefore, in 2020, fewer women were due to screen than in previous years. And furthermore, most women screening in 2020 were likely to be already overdue for their test. Using a well-established model of HPV and cervical cancer, we simulated key scenarios to determine the impact of disruptions to our NCSP, taking into account HPV vaccination, which was offered to women aged up to 39 years. While there were no explicit restrictions on access to cervical screening, disruptions in screening participation could be expected due to women being less likely to attend for screening or a reduction in healthcare capacity. Therefore, we worked with the Department of Health to choose exploratory scenarios covering a range of possibilities. In particular, we simulated 2020 screening program disruptions of six and 12 months where women who miss their test are screened in the following two years. We also considered a nine month disruption where all tests missed in 2020 were then performed in 2021. For each scenario, we report on additional cancer diagnoses and deaths due to these disruptions. In addition to the number of women screened and colposcopies performed over 2020 to 2022. Depending on the degree of screening disruption, we estimated that up to just over a million women could miss their routine primary screening test in 2020, resulting in increased test volumes for the following two years. This disruption is predicted to have a flow-on effect on colposcopies. We note, however, these estimates exclude colposcopies performed in women with symptoms suggestive of cervical cancer. The three disruption scenarios resulted in 21 to 69 additional cervical cancer cases equivalent to an increase of up to 3.6%. In terms of both total number and percentages, women aged 30 to 49 years bore the brunt of this increase. As well as causing additional cancers, screening program disruptions are also expected to result in upstaging of localised and regional grade cancers due to later detection. Here, we predict that 6 to 18 localised cervical cancers are upstaged to regional, and three to nine regional cancers will be upstaged to distant disease. The combination of additional and upstaged cervical cancers due to simulated screening program disruptions is predicted to result in six to 20 additional cervical cancer deaths over the coming years. Aloha everyone, my name is Victoria Mack from the University of Hawaii Cancer Center, and I will be presenting on the eLife article titled the Impact of COVID-19 on Cancer Screening and Treatment in Older Adults, the Multi-Ethnic Cohort Study. First, I'll start with a brief introduction to COVID-19 or the coronavirus disease of 2019, which was discovered in December 2019 and declared a worldwide pandemic by the WHO on March 11, 2020. By March 10, 2023, more than 6.9 million deaths and 676 million cases were reported worldwide. 
Due to the rapid spread and high infectivity rates, stay-at-home orders were decreed worldwide to allow for physical distancing and self-isolation. This led to a strong impact on people's lives affecting their eating habits, everyday behaviors, and physical activity. Additionally, elderly people and people of any age with certain underlying medical conditions are at increased risk for severe illness from COVID-19. The pandemic has affected the access to cancer screenings, especially for colorectal cancer and breast cancer. A study by London et al. examined the effects of COVID-19 on cancer screenings by comparing data in the United States from April 2020 to April 2019. They found that colorectal cancer screenings decreased by nearly 85% and breast cancer screenings decreased by nearly 90%. In addition, studies have suggested that educational attainment is associated with adherence to cancer screenings. For breast cancer, Damiani et al. found a positive association between level of education and adherence to mammography screening. For colorectal cancer, a study conducted in 2016 utilized data from the 2012 Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System within the Veteran Health Administration. The study examined the association between education and colorectal cancers among U.S. veterans 50 to 75 years old. The researchers found that Education level and income level show a statistically significant dose-dependent effect on colorectal cancer screenings. The purpose of our study was a cross-sectional study to understand how COVID-19 affected access to cancer screenings and treatment by studying participants in the University of Hawaii Cancer Center Multi-Ethnic Cohort, or MEC, study. The multi-ethnic cohort has followed over 215,000 older residents of Hawaii and Los Angeles and consists of men and women from Japanese Americans, Native Hawaiians, African Americans, Latinos, and whites. As of 2019, there are approximately 100,000 surviving MEC members and the median age is 82 years old. The goal of the MEC is to elucidate lifestyle and genetic risk factors responsible for the differences in cancer and other chronic diseases disease occurrences among ethnic or racial populations. For the methods, the first baseline survey was sent out in May 2020, and the last response was collected in September 2020. The baseline survey was consisted of 104 questions. Questions consisted of demographics, health status, including current cancer treatment, comorbidities, medication use, and postponement of healthcare visits, surgical procedures, and cancer screenings, etc. Approximately 7,000 participants responded, 6,088 via the online survey and 906 via the paper survey. After the baseline survey, weekly and monthly shorter follow-up surveys were sent until April 2021. Demographics such as race, ethnicity, and maximum years of education attained, birthplace, pre-existing and incident disease outcomes, and lifestyle risk factors are available from the MEC database. For the analysis, descriptive statistics, and multivariate analyses was conducted using SAS software. The response rates for men were 7.2% and for women were 6.3%. The ethnicity with the highest response rates was whites, followed by Japanese Americans, Native Hawaiians, other, African Americans, and Latino. This is a table of the participant demographics of the baseline survey participants from Hawaii and Los Angeles. For our study, we only looked at the baseline survey results. And also, in the interest of time for this presentation, I'll only be sharing on the effect of cancer screenings. 3,034 males and 3,940 females responded to our study. The race or ethnicity with the highest respondents was whites and Japanese Americans. The mean plus or minus standard deviation was similar between males and females for age and maximum years of education attained. For males, the mean plus or minus standard deviation body mass index was 26.8 plus or minus 4.6, and for females, it was 25.9 plus or minus 5.8. Here are the results for the effect on cancer screenings due to COVID-19. 5.7% of men and 11% of women had to postpone any cancer screening or procedure due to COVID-19. The screening procedure the most frequently missed was mammography, followed by skin examination, and colorectal cancer screenings. Next, we looked at the risk of postponing cancer screening tests or procedures due to COVID-19 pandemic by demographics using odds ratios. 
Women with more education obtained and women compared to men were more likely to postpone any cancer screening tests or procedure due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Japanese men and women and older women were less likely to postpone any cancer screening tests or procedure during the COVID-19 pandemic. We also analyzed by comorbidities. Men diagnosed with cancer in the past five years and women with lung disease, COPD, or asthma and those diagnosed with cancer in the past five years were more likely to postpone any cancer screening test or procedure due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Next is the discussion on the effect on cancer screenings. The survey respondents did not report a large percentage for postponing cancer screenings. In the MEC study, 5.7% of men and 11% of women had to postpone. Most frequently missed was mammography followed by skin examination and colorectal cancer screenings. These numbers were not as expected, but could be explained by the older age of the sample that was obtained. The recommended cutoff age for breast and colorectal cancer screenings is 74 and 75 years old. Half of the respondents were age 75 and older. However, when stratifying the responses by 75 and younger, the numbers were similar to the overall sample size, 6.1% versus 5.7% of men overall, and 12.3% versus 11% of women overall. Postponement of these cancer screening categories is consistent with data from a different study looking at a sample of health claims clearinghouse records from 18 states containing 184 million claims from 30 million patients in 2019 and 94 million claims from 20 million patients for the first six months in 2020. For that study, researchers found that mammograms and pap smears decreased by nearly 80% and colonoscopies would decrease by nearly 90% when comparing April 2020 to 2019 data. In addition, the likelihood of postponing cancer screenings being related to age was also analyzed. For our next study, older women were 4% per year of age less likely to postpone. And this finding was consistent with a study examining determinants of postponed cancer screenings during the COVID-19 pandemic in Germany. The research has found that the likelihood of postponing cancer screenings was negatively associated or less likely with older age. For the strengths of the study, since the study and data collection was done from one's home, it shows that it's a good design for pandemic or stay-at-home orders. Additionally, online surveys are possible in the MEC, but due to the older age structure of the cohort, participation is limited, especially in African Americans and Latinas. For the limitations, although our study had a diverse population, Subgroups of race or ethnicity, such as African Americans and Latinos, have a smaller sample size compared to other subgroups. Also, our sample size was not representative of the entire MEC cohort. Since the self data was self-reported, there's also possibilities of misclassification due to measurement error. Lastly, there is low response rates across all race or ethnicities. In conclusion, our study demonstrated the possibility of using a mature cohort study of well-characterized individuals to characterize the effects of a public health emergency. The study revealed associations between factors like race or ethnicity, age, education level, and status of comorbidities and healthcare decisions of MEC participants made during the COVID-19 pandemic in Hawaii and Los Angeles. Increased monitoring of patients in high-risk groups for cancer is of the utmost importance as the chance of un undiagnosed cases due to delayed screening and medical care increases. For future directions, since we will be identifying cancer diagnoses and deaths through linkages to cancer registries in Hawaii and Calif California, we will be able to examine whether a greater proportion of cancers are diagnosed at a late stage in the aftermath of the pandemic and investigate any differences among ethnic or racial groups. Similarly, through linkage of the cohort to Medicare, we will be able to identify MEC members who developed COVID-19 and investigate long-term complications and survival across age and race. For the acknowledgements, funding was partially supported by the Omidyar Ohana Foundation and a grant from the National Cancer Institute. For correspondence, you can reach me at vmac at hawaii.edu. Thank you for your time. Mahalo nui.